Hello, I'm Josh Bear, and welcome to the Bear Facts Podcast. On today's episode, we're joined by UC Pilcannon for his first sit-down interview since recently leaving his role as global president of Christie's to start his own independent advisory, Art Pilcannon. If you know how good the artwork is, you know when to pause. If you know who's bidding, because they're people that have collected with you for many years, you also know when to pause. You also know how to keep the pace of an auction going, which is incredibly important. I mean, if something fails, you move on, and you move on with the same pace as you would as if it had sold for a world record price. So sort of pace, poise, and professional knowledge of the market is absolutely quintessential in my view. Join us as UC shares his plans for his new business, his thoughts on what's next for the art market, and stories from his time auctioneering and negotiating deals for some of the biggest record-breaking sales. This episode is brought to you by David's Werner. They also have a podcast, Dialogues. Give it a listen after this episode. Now it's a few months that you're like a free man out of Christie's after what was 40 years. What's it feel like? It's fantastic. I've enjoyed it hugely. I got a number of people writing to me after I left with all sorts of thoughts for the future, recommendations. And uh, no, it's uh, spiritually, it's wonderful just to be able to work on things that you personally find interesting and important, um, both privately and professionally. So it's a great break. I'm enjoying it already. So projects like individual artworks, curating shows, building collections, working on your golf game. Which is it now? I think the one that I might not do is the golf game, um, but the others, all of the above. Um, I spend a good deal of time talking to collectors that are wanting to buy. I'll be buying over the next couple of days here at Christie's and Sotheby's in London. Uh, looking forward to the New York auctions. Um, I've also been talking to museums who want to loan objects for future shows. There's the wonderful Monet show of London at the Courtauld coming up at the end of the year and, and many other major exhibitions that I want to make sure that collectors lend pictures to. I think that's a responsibility for anybody that's out in the art market advising major collectors. And then, of course, working with people that are putting together major collections at the top of the art market, which has been my life for the past 30-odd years. And obviously, there are certain individuals I've worked with for some time who are looking to continue to collect major works privately in particular. One of the reasons that I've left Christie's really is to look after major collectors who've got the appetite both to buy major works and to lend major works. Those are two of the critical questions that I ask individuals that want to work with me. We're going to do some episodes about art advisory, but sometimes I think, in fact, the, the element you didn't speak about, which is the hardest element, which is how to sell art. Because in general, buying art is way easier than selling art. Would you comment on that? And are you thinking that I would take that as an element of what you're helping collectors do using your inside knowledge of how the other side functions. Yes, I mean, advising people to sell privately or at auction is a key part of that, but also the whole process of looking at major collections and saying, look, what direction are you going in? Uh, which objects that you bought early on should you be selling now in order to improve the collection you have? I think there are a lot of passive owners who should really be transformed into transactors to, if you like, finesse the collections that they have. Um, and that's an important thing to do. It's a difficult thing to do sometimes because the objects that collectors have bought in their early years are often things that they're closest to. But if the market's right to put those onto the open market or to sell them privately, I think it's good practice. And so if you like, tidying up major collections is very much part of what I want to do. I think often with advisors, one realizes after a while, I'm sure even as you worked in a big environment with many specialists, that there's a certain personality type that you connect with. Um, I know I have one. Do you have something that you would sort of identify I'm really good with and fill in the blank of that? In terms of people that I really feel had a great eye, who I've worked with and continue to work with, the likes of Loic Guza, 
uh, the likes of Frank Giro, the likes of Brett Gorvey. But I'm saying really yes. have a view. We really those, have a view. Those advisors are great because yeah. they have beliefs and they're willing to be the only one out there and the first one out there. Which and, is how I am. And then with a client, I mean, I'm not good with shoppers who feel like they need to buy something every week. I deal with a certain kind of history. I'm good with people who know nothing. I'm good with people who know a lot. Most of the people are in between. Is there like a category of collector that you feel you sort of had that sort of chemical fit with the best? Yes, it's people that are in the market for the long term, people that actually want to buy major works of art for themselves. Obviously, if you buy the very best, the likelihood is that those are the pictures are going to appreciate the most. And that's the direction I've gone in. Um, one of the reasons why I was so keen to stay at Christie's for such a long time is that the last 10 to 15 years has really been about the masterpieces market. Um, with the help of Brett and Loic in particular, we went at that market in 2014. I think the first major event for us was the selling of the Bacon Triptych. And after that, we had a sequence of sales where we were looking for very major works of art at $50 million plus, And we sold a lot of them in that period. And it created a marketplace for us to work in, which was the greatest collectors that owned the objects and the new collectors that wanted to buy them. And that's very, very much where I want to stay. I'm always curious how much of your time, both privately now and certainly at Christie's, was spent talking about the art, and you talk about masterpieces, and how much is spent talking about the money? I think when I was Christie's, a lot of my time was spent talking about the money, uh, not just in terms of the value of objects, but the risks, the guarantee numbers, and what position we wanted to take with regard to a deal. Now that I'm free of that, it's more about the art, and the art for me is vital. So paying the right price for a major work of art is fine, um, and that's what it's about, trying to identify opportunities to find rare objects that simply are all in museums, with the exception of the odd piece that you chase. That's when you pay an exceptional price. But um, also being reasonable about the acquisition number is important to every collector. Um, but for me, it's not the essence of what I'll be doing. The essence of what I'll be doing is advising people to buy nine out of tens. And there aren't many of them. So, for example, in this series of sales, there are relatively few. But those that are, are worth having a go at. Well, I often say to my clients, let's start with, do you love it? And then we can talk about the money. Because it's a waste of time to talk about the money if it's not good enough. That's my song. And book. that's the first point. Do you like the object? Is it something that you want to own? And then let's talk about how much it might cost you to acquire it. And looking back years later, do you go, oops, maybe, you know, I told them to stop at X million and now it's worth 10X. And you think maybe I never thought that the prices for it would get as high as they are. Yes, I think that the art market has run away in certain areas. And I'm fortunate and happy that people didn't go that far. There are a few exceptions where people went beyond. And um, I don't think if those objects came back on the market now that they would achieve those prices. Obviously, with the Russians dropping out of the market, with the Asians being more quiet last year, there are certain markets that did drop quite considerably. Um, but that does not mean that they won't come back. But similarly, there are markets historically that have been too hot um, and I've witnessed that. And hopefully the people that I've advised didn't get caught in the... How about your greatest triumphs and failures of telling someone to keep going or some time to stop? Anything specific comes to mind? So on Go, uh, way back when I was looking after German sales at Christie's in the 90s, um, I was completely convinced that Yavlensky's market was too low. And we had a picture of three to 400,000 of Helen Yavlensky. And a very nice jewellery dealer who I've known for years asked me, you know, what would you recommend? And I recommended that he should buy this picture. And he bid to 900000 three times the estimate or so, which was brave. Three years later, I called him. I said, the Yavlensky market is now hot. And he sold it for $3.2 So effectively 10 times the original estimate that he bid for it only four or five years before. So that was an example of maybe the marketing power of, the auction houses, where when you commit to a surrealist sale or a German sale or Italian sale, you can create interest. But I think it was all credible because I think Yavlensky is a very important artist. Um, that having been said, now the Russians are not in the market, and Yavlensky, a great Russian painter from their perspective, prices are quite suppressed. So it'll be interesting to see how the Yavlensky does tomorrow night at Christie's. A great painting as well. Same uh, league of artwork.
And any bandwagons you got on and you went, oops, maybe uh, didn't get that one quite right, either artistically or financially? Um, funnily enough, our judgments in terms of guarantees at Christie's have been pretty spot on, particularly over the last five years. I've seen other houses have problems. Um, and obviously, we've been in the game for those deals. That's in my previous life, working as a sort of a judge of value. I think if you look at the contemporary market, and I was involved hugely in that from the last 20 years at Christie's, you know, there are artists that have gone out of favour whose markets have dropped that at one moment were incredibly strong. Um, so there are a certain number of works by young artists early on in their careers that I think the prices have definitely uh, more than halved. And it's just a question of whether with time their careers will flourish and prosper because generally early works by artists tend to come back. You know, if it's early Chagall or it's early Kandinsky or whatever, their markets somehow come back. And that must be the case also for painters, you know, such as Freud, Bacon, we've seen it already, but even the younger artists today, their early works that may now not seem to be at the same level as they were when they were first offered on the auction market will come back. As a long-term private advisor versus a newbie, clients love it when you tell them, you were right, I was wrong, should have bought more of those. <laughs> they love it when you say, like, three Kusamas was enough. And it's like, what they thought that we should buy 10. I don't know, three is plenty. And you go back and say, yeah, you were right. It makes them feel really good. So admitting that like they were smarter than you, it's like, I know they're not listening. So it's a good strategy sometimes. Yeah, but you go back to the great dealers as well. You look at somebody like Bruno Bischofberger, one of the masters, you know, and you look at his view of Warhol and Basquiat back in the day. I mean, he was a complete precursor. Nobody would have believed you know, how the markets for both artists, particularly for Basquiat, would become so central to, you know, the cultural development of the 21st century and people's belief in that young man. And similarly, you look at Bill Aquavella when he did the Matisse deal back in the day. He took an enormous position way before the auction houses did, you know, with a great group of uh, Pierre Matisse gallery pieces of Nero's, Matisse's and so forth, which, um, you know, nobody in the broader market would have committed to. So those judgments can also apply to dealers when you say to them, you know what, right, cool. And of course, there are others that will say, I knew the market was going to develop. I wish I had. You hear a lot of I wish I had, particularly in my place working at Christie's as the president. Join us after the break as UC uncovers the secret art of the auctioneer, how to build momentum and when to slow down, like how he coaxed out the final bids on the $450 million Da Vinci sale. This episode of the Bear Facts podcast is brought to you by David Zwerner. Their podcast, Dialogues, is about artists and the way they think, with each episode featuring a conversation with artists, writers, filmmakers, and musicians exploring what it means to make things today. Tune in for conversations with artists like Njideka Akunili Crosby, Elizabeth Payton, Rikrit Tiravani, and so many more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Many people don't know you as well as an expert and specialist in that, and they know you as the face of Christie's from the rostrum as the number one auctioneer. Could you talk a little bit about, as an auctioneer, how you would feel on the stage and whether you believe and why a better auctioneer can do a better job and get a bigger price, if that's your role and how you do that? I think the two roles that you described are implicitly linked. I think being a great expert, which I, I ran the Impressions department after all for over a decade at Christie's, is part of the secret. If you know how good the artwork is, you know when to pause. If you know who's bidding, because they're people that have collected with you for many years, you also know when to pause. You also know how to keep the pace of an auction going, which is incredibly important. I mean, if something fails, you move on and you move on with the same pace as you would as if it had sold for a world record price. So sort of pace, poise, and professional knowledge of the market is absolutely quintessential in my view. So when something buys in, you're just like, it's out of your brain, you're able to disengage from, I know that consigner, it's a great, all that, you just like turn the page. 100%. I think that's probably the Finnish blood in me. Sissel or just, uh, how would I put it, the ability to move on and do the right thing at the next step. 
interestingly, not a lot of people recognize this, but the very next lot after Leonardo da Vinci that made $450 million was a Basquiat at $25 million, which was guaranteed by the house and failed to sell. Most of us, when consigning, say we don't want to be the one after the biggest lot, that all of a sudden people are running around and their hair is on fire. I think that... Would that painting have sold if it was before the Da Vinci? No, it was all about the picture. So for me, putting five masterpieces back to back is fine, as long as the auctioneer is able to judge the pace, settle the room and pause. So with the Leonardo, even during the bidding, I paused for 60 seconds when we hit 220 million because the bidders need time. And that's something very interesting I've noticed about most auctioneers is that when they've got a lot of competition, there were still three people in the bidding for that, they rush. When there's a lot of competition, slow down, pause, give people time, because actually what they're indicating is their appetite to acquire. And if somebody's got the appetite to acquire, it far transcends their appetite to drop out. If you're in a hurry, it gives them an excuse that you're hurrying, you're rushing them. If you go slowly you're much more likely to, A, get the top price, but B, have everybody feeling they were given the same opportunity to buy the object. Because once the collector has decided that they're in the sale room, or even privately, wanting to acquire an object, you have to give people the right appropriate amount well, of Those time. people, people, are, people, are, different. people are, are different. not used to not getting what they want. 100%. So if you can get them to raise their hand and say, I want it, they're sometimes emotionally going to go crazy. If you never got them to they want it, then they can be disciplined. You know, if you're a multi-billionaire and you're looking at a million dollar object and you want it, it's kind of money isn't the object at that point, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, in your lifetime, you get the one opportunity to buy the object of your desire. So Lawrence Graf, when he bid for the Liechtenstein in the front row in New York, probably 10 years ago now, I had no idea specifically that he wanted to buy that object, but once he started to bid, I could tell from his body language that he was in it. And when he dropped out, I know Lawrence very well, I leant forward to him and I said, Lawrence, are you sure? And paused. I paused for quite a long time. He came back in and, having said no, very audibly to the whole room, and um, he bought the picture at, I think, $10 million more. And to this day, he thanks me for giving him that time. How good are you as of an auctioneer if you show up to do a ninth century silver? Is there even ninth century silver? There must be. But when you're doing a sale that you had no involvement with and no actual knowledge and you don't know the clients, were you good at that? I'm always more comfortable when I know the client base. But if I know the quality of the art and the specialists were clear enough with me about what was going to travel and what was going to be sold at the reserve or near it, and also gave me a complete description of the room, the Robert Ellsworth sale, for example, I flew over from London to take that. They were very keen for me to take it. We broke every single record in the book in a packed sale room. But was I that, was given was a hugely... The first Banksy-like moment of a sale, as I sort of recall? <laughs> it was Banksy-like moment because the very last lot of the sale was a Buddha, where the arm of the Buddha actually dropped off, literally as I was going to offer it. It was center stage, and the arm of the Buddha, for whatever reason, hadn't been properly attached. It was just on a little peg. And as I started to open the bidding, the arm fell off. And of course, everybody in the room gasped as they watched the arm drop onto the stage below them. I just turned to the Buddha and said, are you bidding? Which completely broke the atmosphere and actually made people feel spiritually that maybe Robert Ellsworth was in the room. Something was there present amongst us. Last lot of the cell, historic cell where every object had broken a world record. And interestingly, the specialists were nervous about how this ancient artifact would sell, but knew that it had been very important to Ellsworth. And it went on to make a world record. It's a huge applause. And afterwards, many of the collectors that had come from China were completely with me in saying, yep, we felt it. Robert was in the room. Because he'd been very close to so many of those people over so many years and being a great supporter of that marketplace. So they were very, very pleased about that. And uh, extraordinary moment. Stay with us for our final segment as UC reveals his plans for his new business and his predictions for the future of the auction market. This episode of the Bear Facts podcast is brought to you by David Zwerner. Their podcast, Dialogues, is about artists and the way they think, with each episode featuring a conversation with artists, writers, filmmakers, and musicians exploring what it means to make things today. 
Tune in for conversations with creatives from Luca Guadagnino to Sofia Coppola to Hilton Alls and so many more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Do you think it's good for the consigners to be out of the room when you're auctioning something? Can you feel a vibe of people looking at the seller going, I don't like you, I don't, or that something there about the person who's selling being in the room? I tell my clients, go out to dinner, I'll tell you what happened. Some of them like to be in the room when it I happens. I prefer them in the room. I prefer them in the room or because? being there. So a couple of instances, I sold a monk print for a world record price when I was in the print department years ago. And I said to the clients, Norwegians, please come to the room. They stood at the back of the room. And when we sold the object for them for a world record, it was a world record for any modern print at the time, hand-coloured screen, um, they rose in unison, cheering which made me feel great. They bought a house with the proceeds, which they then revealed to me. They invited me to the housewarming when they bought it, which was a remarkable moment for them. Um, I look back at the Paul Allen sale. Paul Allen's sister was in the skybox, and afterwards it was a fantastic moment. Can you hear them cheering in the skybox? I know where they are always. Yeah, I used to anyway. And uh, there are many instances of that. You'll remember... Uh, the two Warhols, the uh, Marlin and the Elvises, when that was sold. Do you remember the banging on the window of the skybox in celebration of the prices? And that spurs you on. You feel good about it. I mean, I, I have to say that I always felt that I was... But there's some, the, there some guys the that people don't like. And they're mostly finance guys. Sorry, bros. And there's like a sense of like, I don't want him to make money. And like competition, you never had that feeling, somebody in the room. Uh, no, I didn't actually. I, well, listen, from my perspective, I was working on behalf of the person in the room. So having them in the room made me feel good that they were there to witness how well things went. So that's an interesting question. Are you working then for the buyer? Are you working for the seller? Or are you working for the auction house? And it's very tough to be fiduciary to all three at the same time. It's a balance, but at the end of the day, I'm working for the seller. As an auctioneer, I'm always selling for them personally. And also, as you referee the dynamic of the auction room, your role is to get the highest price from the buyers in the room in a fair way. Well, probably the greatest investments were from people paying record prices at the time. Undoubtedly. And if you're trying to save 10 or 20%, those are probably the worst investments. And do you think art's even investable? Do you think in those terms? I do. I think art is investable. Uh, I think particularly today, it's a proper asset class. When I began working at Christie's in the 80s, it was a very narrow market, which led to when the Japanese pulled out a terrible art depression in the art market in the early 90s, 90 to 92. The next time we saw it was in 2000. Probably not a good time to have expanded and built a big new gallery space, 7,500 square feet, 1990. Maybe timing is a critical Component. That's just an it aside. Was foresight, John. It's just foresight. Then the market was a billion dollars. Yes. Now for Christie's, it's six, eight billion dollars if uh, the markets are in a good place. So I don't know. Uh, foresight is a is a wonderful thing, or hindsight as well. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Uh, but then looking at it uh, after that, just in terms of where the market has gone, if you think about it, uh, the market has been incredibly consistent over the last twenty five years. Even looking at the two thousand eight to two thousand and nine. 2008 depression was fixed by Yves Saint Laurent with one hit. Suddenly confidence came back. It's a confidence game. And the one Warhol selling for $44 million. 100%. The disaster picture. On an $8 million estimate, somebody having the guts, we're in London and came from London, to put it out there with that risk and see that the market said, "Uh uh-uh, we still have appetite for art. That was kind of the key moment on top of Yves Saint Laurent, which was winter 2009. That's it. Well, it was interesting because the owner of that picture was somebody that wasn't very close to the market. And when I went to see them a few years later, I thanked them. And he said to me, what do you mean? I said, you're the man that kept the market in the right place with the sale of that object for post-war art. And he couldn't believe it. He's passed away now, but he reminded me of that many times in the future, saying, you really meant that? I said, 100%. So it's fantastic that you should mention it. I've actually predicted another bull market, mm-hmm. and which is an odd thing to do when everybody's sort of worrying that the sky is falling and they've overreacted to a price correction. I'm saying 
and wonder if you agree that there is another bull market coming. In my view, it's not about price, it's about volume, and that the market could grow five or 10 times bigger with the number of people with ultra high net worth who've yet to buy art still yet to come. I agree on several of those points. First of all, I love the fact that you don't call it a Josh Bear market. Uh, you can't call it a bear market, can you? Because that would be appropriation. But the reason that the market is going to hold itself up is that we're working in a fully global environment where you've got buyers from every corner of the world interested in buying objects that are culturally important. If the vendors are willing to part with major objects, the market will hold its price. If it's about volume, I think there's enough appetite to cover the volume. The interesting question is, will the top objects that are available be offered on the open market? And will the vendors have the confidence to put $50 million plus objects on the market? I suspect that in the next couple of years, it's less likely. And reading what Guillaume Chiruti put out from Christie's recently about the appetite of the auction houses to be more involved in private sales it's probable that some of those major lots won't come onto the auction market. They'll be transacted privately. So you might find that there's a little bit of a hesitation around the, let's say, the $20 million plus object, and that one needs to see how confident people are to go after those in the public environment. Well, I agree. We tend to make it that the only real market is the auction market yeah. and the public part of the auction market. And we all, on the inside, know that we don't want that to be so transparent. And to what's really going on, you can't just automatically assume that that's completely scotastically independent of things. And with the spreads that the auction houses might be taking, particularly at the lower levels, and the willingness to take the risk of selling major objects without guarantees is gonna be diminished. That's clear for now that I think it's true. We don't really know what's going on at Aquavella behind closed doors. Maybe he made 10 sales of $250 million last month. Could be. And Gagosian and, and... Et cetera, et cetera. Werner and House yeah. of Earth. I mean, these are all people that are handling very major objects. So now you're in position to sort of sum up to be part of those deals as well. So how do you describe your new business? <laughs> Listen, the next five years are going to be interesting for me. I'm going to be buying works of art at the top of the market for a handful of people that want to work with me. Um, that'll be institutions as well. I'd like to auctioneer, watch this space, perhaps 2025, 2026. Um, if any of the major collectors want me to sell on their behalf, I'd be delighted to do so. I want to break from it now. And really, it's giving good advice and uh, working with the institutions as well as they organize their exhibitions. I've probably got quite a good insight into where major objects are that haven't been seen for many, many years. And I'd be delighted to make sure that the public has the opportunity to see them. Auctioneers are a bit of rock stars these days. How did you feel as this sort of like movie star on the stage? Did you like it? Not a great deal, actually. I've got to be honest with you. I enjoyed the process of taking the sales, but being in the sort of public eye all the time is a bit odd when you're approached at airports and things like that to chat to people that you've never met before about the art world and all the rest of it. But what I did enjoy was being the director. So if you look at Sam Mendes, for example, great, great theatre director. There's something about being able to come into a sale room direct the process, you've got the actors, you've got the scriptors at some degree, but the way that you conduct the sale is unique to yourself. And I think that a great director can bring 20, 25% to any roles, even to Hamlet or to Macbeth, even the classics. And I think a great auctioneer could probably do the same. I used to get a kick because every so often I'd be standing there reporting on, you know, under bidder Mugabe and standing with the press and you'd look over and ask me if I was bidding. And I remember one night I was standing there and actually I was bidding and you were like not paying attention. I'm like waving my arms. It's like, yes, we want that. And you're like, you know, the one time you're not looking and taking my bid was when I was actually bidding in that sale and we didn't announce before the sale. I sold I, it to you though, eventually. Yeah. I'd be persuaded. Yes, and all that. And like, because they didn't tell you 
usually you know who's going to bid. My client called me during the sale to say, I want to buy this thing. And it's like, I'm scurrying around a after the auction started. I'm standing there like waving a paddle even. And you're like looking around. In fact, we were the only bidder. You were? Yeah. And you would guarantee that I saved the house on that. There was a guarantee on that. So, but you would have fun up there and you often made fun of me. You were my best spotter. Yeah, Every like... now and again, the seller, you were giving me a spot, particularly in London, actually. You were fantastic because it's a little bit more um, random as to where people sit and why. And uh, when you gave me the nod, I'd uh, execute for you. Perfect. So I miss that with you being gone, but maybe you'll be back. No, I will be back. Oh. Quito. Quito Spalia. Quito Spalia. And remember, do not transact without the bare facts. We'd like to give a big thank you to UC for joining us for this episode of the Bear Facts Podcast, brought to you by David Zwerner. Our host is Josh Bear. Our executive producer is Lu Yang Zhang. Our content strategist is Bo Liang Shin. I'm Will Griffith, our associate editor, and our editing team is Mona Productions. Subscribe today wherever you get your podcasts and check back soon for future episodes as we unpack the inner workings of the global art industry through exclusive, candid interviews with key players in the business as they offer their perspectives on art and the market in the U.S., Europe, Asia, and beyond. <laughs>